hear some funny stories too. So we're, I, know, I know these people have stories among themselves. Dr. Matthews? Thank you, Tom. Well, let's start out with a story. Have you got a story about Phil? Phil who? <laughs> Just too many of them. <laughs> Dick? I can't. I got to tell you. <laughs> My favorite moment with Phil Graham, and I have to tell you, there were many of them. But my absolute favorite was when he came to my office to explain to me legislation he was working on in order to protect uh, derivatives. And uh, what is that? Uh, lo uh, loan credit, uh, loan swaps for pork bellies. And what distressed me the most is he wouldn't keep his eye off my stomach while he's telling me this. <laughs> Nevertheless, I thought to myself, oh, I'm in port now. He says, uh, Dick, listen to me. I'm smart about these things. Now, I realized immediately he wasn't bragging. He was just understating an obvious fact. And that's, uh, I, I, for some reason, I cherished that moment. Well, it, I understood what he had to say. It was a quite elaborate and difficult piece of legislation. He enlisted my assistance, which I took as a great compliment. And by golly, we actually got that done. And thanks to your innovation, and my little bit of blocking on your behalf. So that's my, that's my favorite Phil Graham story. Well, I was attempting to refrain. Uh, some of my favorites is probably not a suitable audience, uh, but I see uh, Kevin Brannon, and there's a couple of other former staffers here. So I um, used to work on the senator's staff, and we would go all around the state have breakfast every single day with kind of community leaders. And any question that was asked, the senator was on top of it, be it pork bellies, be it actuarial tables in Social Security, be it atomic energy policy. And so he goes around and asks if anybody has any questions. And don't ask me why, but it was a lady in Abilene, Texas, looks over at a breakfast and says, Senator Graham, what do you think about human sexuality? <laughs> and for maybe the first time ever, I saw him pause for a second, and then he said, I'm not certain, but I think I'm for it. <laughs> well, good. All right, both, all three of you are retired. So you can say things now that you might not have been able to say when you were still elected members. How do you think Congress has changed since you've stepped out? Well, I, there's this terrible temptation to think that when you were there, it was all wonderful, and that it just went to hell when you left. <laughs> and there's a little truth in that. But I think today there's a couple of things that are different. One is the issues are so important. The, you know, Senator Byrd from West Virginia and I were very close friends and political allies. And we disagreed on spending. We disagreed on the line item veto. We disagreed on the balanced budget amendment of the Constitution. But... He, he wanted more government than I wanted, but I didn't view his views as being a threat to the future of the country. Uh, now the parties are so far apart that I think we're in a situation where it is very difficult to compromise. If you want to go to Los Angeles, somebody else going to St. Louis, you can travel with them, but if they're going to Miami, there's no sense going to Miami when you want to go to Los Angeles. So I think that's part of it. I think, secondly, because the issues are more important and the voters are more polarized, 
that and because the incumbents have protected themselves in reapportionment, redistricting, you have very few members of the House and the Senate that have broad-based political views. And so people are way apart. So it's not totally the fault of the people who were there. Um, and I would just say finally, when I went to Congress, we just had a big problem. We had had, we had, had 9.2 percent inflation for eight years. The Soviet Union was on the march all over the world. Um, uh, we had problems that demanded something be done about them, and uh, we did it. We had Ronald Reagan, too, which helped. Well, let me, I, 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 let me relate that to what we're doing here, first of all. The first year I was in Congress, I realized something. These guys had bad numbers. And I quickly came to the point where I said, you cannot trust any number coming from official Washington. And that's, by the way, why I created IPI because I wanted to have an independent source that I knew would give me real, factual data, and I knew it, and I could go to it. And I want to thank you, Tom, for maintaining the tradition and, and keeping IPI that beacon of truth that is so necessary. Uh, the fact is, when I became majority leader, I left the organization to protect it from politics, because I knew it would be attacked if I was majority leader. But you kept it going. Now, this takes us to what Phil's doing today. He's blowing the whistle on phony numbers. And it's not that it happens by accident. Damn it, they're doing it on purpose. And they've been doing it on purpose. So when I look at today's Congress, I think the base problem is they are fundamentally out of touch with reality. Most of the big problems they wrestle with are more imagined than, than real because they've been propped up by phony numbers. And so they wallow around in a policy world that is undecipherable because they have no data and they resort to politics because, bless their little hearts, if you put Congress together with the nation's press, that's the only simple-minded thing they can understand. So they do what they know, which is try to cut the other guy's throat because they have no reliable basis by which, which they could take the measure of a real public policy issue and address it. So if they just quit, damn it, lying to each other and make each other require that they purposely create reliable, accurate data, they would do a great deal to solve their problems. I only fear that they don't want to. They like their world because their world gives them dominion over you and me. So don't make mistake about it. They do it on purpose, and they do it across a broad range of things. And thank the Lord that we've got people like Phil Graham that have the ability and the will to blow the whistle. Final word. i got to say what I came here to say. <laughs> of all the people with whom I was privileged to associate in Washington, by any standard or criteria, you would take the measure of a fellow person, Phil Graham is the absolute finest person I ever knew in that town. And he was the most able servant of you. Would you say that again? Hold on. I should be smart enough not to follow that. 
Uh, just two quick perspectives on the question of essentially what may be wrong or what's changed in Congress today. And uh, I'd be interested if Joe and Kenny agree as well. I would say during our tenure number one, it's you certainly see the rise of social media where for so long in the history of the republic, to be a successful member of Congress, you had to be a successful legislator. And to be a successful legislator, you actually had to have subject matter expertise and you actually had to negotiate with other members of Congress. You compromised your policies without ever compromising your principles, but now you can be a rock star on MSNBC as a socialist Democrat, you can be a rock star on Fox News, come from the entertainment wings of the respective party, and never have an impact on public policy whatsoever. That's one thing that's changed. Something that I think is far more pernicious, and it's the old, you know, tossing the frog into the boiling pot as opposed to having them simmer, and that is the rise of the administrative state. There is law that is passed every day in the United States of America, and it does not come out of Article I of the Constitution. So just raw quantitatively, there's about 15 regulations for every one law, and these are very momentous. And it's made by people who are not accountable to we the people, who never, who never have to face the ballot. So to some extent in Congress, particularly the dynamic you see today between a Democratic White House and say a Republican House, if you're a Republican member of the House, there's only two votes that count. It's the periodic debt ceiling bill and the appropriation bill or bills. Outside of that, you are irrelevant to the lawmaking process. That's the only leverage you have. And so we are losing the rule of law to the discretion of regulators and idle hands are the devil's workshop. So it's, it's kind of this vicious cycle, which came first, legislators that had nothing to legislate or people who are rising to the entertainment wings uh, of their party. I gotta tell you, I, I used to sometimes look around and I'd see some colleague of ours embroiled in some scandal of infidelity and I thought to myself, well one, where did they ever find the time to get in trouble? But <laughs> you know, as sad as it is, uh, you know, there wasn't that much to legislate on. I'm personally, greatest privilege of my life to serve in Congress but I never worked so hard to regrettably achieve so little. But I would go back and I would do it in a heartbeat because the principles we fight for are too important to the future of the Republic. And I think if you went back, you would get votes if you wanted to go. Um, I think I'd have to get a new wife. All three of you are what I would call Reagan conservatives. And there was a time when conservatism was sort of evolved around Reagan. If people were giving speeches who were running for Congress, they said, I'm the most conservative. And they would also oftentimes quote Ronald Reagan. Conservatism seems to be changing these days. So I'd like to get your sense of what's different about the conservative movement. Do we still have Reagan-esque conservatism or is it a different type of conservatism? Is it even conservatism? Well, I'm tempted to say you're looking at the aging remnants of Reagan <laughs> Republicanism <laughs> right up here on stage, but I'm not gonna say it because I know it would be very depressing to you. <laughs> I, I, to me, being a conservative is believing in freedom. You either believe in freedom or you don't. And if you believe in freedom, then you, you're committed to a whole set of principles. And the second is the belief that with freedom comes responsibility. Uh, that's what conservatism is to me. Now, we have now people in both parties who claim to be many different things, but um, we don't have a lot of people that I would consider to be real conservatives the way that 
I would define it now. Um, now, again, it's you never know who's out there, what's going to emerge, what's going to happen in the future. But I don't think conservatism wasn't born with Ronald Reagan, and it didn't die with him. But he was, uh, was a very articulate spokesman for it. And uh, having someone espousing it is very, very valuable. Now, when, where are we going to find such a person? Um, I, I don't know. I'd say Mike Pence is the closest to it. There's a Reagan-esque about, Reagan-esque quality about Pence uh, that, I've, that I saw immediately when I got to know him and that I've always respected. I don't think there's anybody else out there on the national scene that I see as Reagan is. Well, let me uh, agree with you about Mike Pence. But I have to tell you, uh, I, uh, it's building on what I earlier said, Washington is so out of touch with reality that politics governs. Now, I define politics as juvenile delinquency, and I'll stand by that <laughs> definition. I think it is a curse to humankind. That doesn't mean public service is bad. That doesn't mean service in office is bad. But politics is just hijinks and backstabbing. And it's become so much the governing ethos in Washington that a guy like Mike Pence is just going to be victimized. Look at the scenario building and the uh, backbiting. If a guy begins to arise, they jump on him. It's just kill the guy before he can get out of the crib. And Mike's getting the treatment now. We've seen our own senator get the treatment ready. I saw an article the other day in one of our more prominent publications comparing the governor of uh, uh, Florida to Hitler. And the, so the fact is right now, the left used to be uh, a bunch of liberals in Congress with an echo chamber in the public at large, in the press and so forth. It's not that anymore. It is now a chorus. And by that I mean the rhetor rhetorical symbiosis is so consolidated that whenever anyone lies, they all swear to it. And when somebody tries to tell you the truth about the greatness of this country, he's condemned as a heretic. And I don't know how. Ronald Reagan's Irish sense of humor carried him through. He, they, they tried to give him the treatment, but he was just too damned lovable. I don't know if we're going to get that kind of a personality character that can withstand the onslaught. And I don't know that Mike's got it, but uh, he does have my respect and my admiration. Well, I see we're running short on time, so can I just say I love Mike Pence, too? <laughs> Anything else? Well, if we have a little time, sure, sure. Uh, I think any um, fair reading of American history would show you major political parties seemingly tend to morph every, say, four decades or so. And I certainly see that within the GOP. It is certainly not the GOP that I joined and I served in. So um, I, I think there's another matters to be concerned about. It's almost like we're seeing the rise of what I would view as a contradiction in terms, but big government conservatism. We don't mind big government as long as it punishes our enemies and rewards our friends. And then all of us, yeah, sooner or later the machine's going to eat you, what you created. Um, I never really thought I would be in a society also that questions freedom of speech and the ability to have the free exchange of ideas in the public square. Um, 
I didn't think that I would see a Republican Party that seemingly has run away from the only solution to a national debt that will cause us to be a second-rate economic power, military power, and second-rate moral authority, and that is reforming current entitlement programs for future generations. I never thought I'd see a Republican Party that would deny an individual citizen their freedom to trade, to buy a sweater from Poland instead of Peoria. It has nothing to do with national economic policy. And now, all of a sudden, industrial policy is making a comeback. We got Republicans who are supporting legislation for some type of speech czar in social media. Phil, I think I stole this one from you, and that is, I would rather have my speech controlled by five West Coast lefties than one government bureaucrat. <laughs> <laughs> so we are in a real battle, I think, for the future of the conservative movement, but I, I also want to leave on a little bit more, I guess, cheerier observation. I still think there are a lot of good men and women who are serving in Congress who still hold views that are held on this stage and held in this room, but frankly, they need our help. They need our help. So please be a part of that process and be, being at this luncheon you are, because I can assure you think tanks are absolutely indispensable to the virtuous cycle of promoting the conservative cause. Okay, last question, because we have a hard stop at 1.30 where Senator Graham is going to go meet with the Sumner Scholar, so we ask that you don't sort of stop him on the way because we need to shuffle him over to the Sumner Scholars. You already answered my last question, but just take a minute. So do I get to go? Yeah, <laughs> in a minute. Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Nobody ever made money by betting against the future of America. No, I, I, I have a sister-in-law once who uh, never had any children, and so she was explaining, you know, the world's d deteriorating, the sea's getting saltier, and, you know, I don't know why you want to bring children in the world. And... Uh, I, my response was, well, who's going to solve all these problems? <laughs> uh, look, America's a very great country. As Adam Smith said, there's a lot of ruin in a great nation. Uh, and uh, I'm a long way from being uh, bearish on the future of America. I think we have a problem now. Uh, we are likely to have, or at least it is believed at this point, that we will have two nominees for president neither of whom I'm for. Um, but in the end, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Uh, you know, I, President Trump's been mistreated. Uh, most of his problems he brought on himself. Uh, but America has its own problems. We got no time for somebody else's problems. And I think uh, the Democrats like Biden because they don't have to have a primary, don't have to show all their dirty underwear. But in the end, I think this may well right itself quicker than people think. Uh, and if it happened, it would be a great gift from heaven. And in a country where we've gotten gifts from heaven very often, it's possible to believe it could happen again. Uh, I've, I've actually, this last six months, I've gone from pessimistic to optimistic because the left is overplaying their hand. The American people, I guess, they're just plain damn disgusted with us. So I'm going to quote an unlikely source, and I know you're going to enjoy it. John Kenneth Galbraith said, <laughs> you got to tolerate the old folk, uh, uh, you, you got to abide the old fogies and don't tolerate the young fogies. And I think we've come in, we're coming to a time now where our young people are going to not tolerate the nonsense. They're just going to demand better and more responsible from themselves and the rest of us. So I think we're turning the corner. And I'm excited to see 
what our children will do to save us from ourselves. Well, I don't know if I'm the youngest person on stage, but I am not an old fogey like uh, <laughs> those who may be seated to my right. I would just have, you know, hearkening back to our nation's history, uh, I mean, for instance, we need, we need perspective. This is a nation that overcame the largest single standing army in the world to declare their independence and to give an opportunity to have a republic that Franklin said, if we could keep it, we went through a bloody civil war. We've gone through 30 some odd financial recessions. I was just a mere child in the 60s. But I can still vividly remember my parents thought the world was coming to an end. Vietnam, Watts riots, the assassination of MLK, the assassination of RFK, veterans, Vietnam veterans getting spat upon. Um, they thought the world was going to end. And guess what? Just a few short years later, it was morning in America again. And President Reagan came into, these, into office, and these two gentlemen, to my right, helped make the entire Reagan revolution possible. It happened once, it can happen again. I can't point to you the exact path, but I know the left wants you to be pessimistic. They want you to give up. Don't be. With your help, America can come back from these troubles, and again, I know our greatest days are ahead of us. And we're going to get Addie to take Senator Graham back to the room. And <laughs> yep. <laughs> no freedom for you. Oh, good dear friend. I want to communicate with you. How do I figure that out? Well, email or 